in this edition of Detroit Performs, a mixed media installation artist whose work mirrors the city of Detroit. This is still a pretty interesting place to live and it will transition to something else. A look into how pedestrians critique the arts in the community. If you're from Detroit, come check it out. If you're not from Detroit, come check it out anyway because it's definitely worth your while. An artist who added a playful touch to New Yorkers' workday commutes. I usually try to make something that's, that's subject specific, you know, so I went back immediately and did research on the building of the subways in the late 19th century and sort of the political era of the time. And a drawer whose parents inspired his craft. The more I work at it, the more I find out about myself, the more I explore my tendencies and my proficiencies. It's all ahead in this edition of Detroit Performs. Major funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the McGregor Fund. Additional funding is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Detroit Performs. I am DJ Oliver. Now Detroit is a city bursting with creativity and ingenuity in its arts community. Scott Hawking is an artist who explores the city. Now finding beauty in its decay and enhancing its surroundings by constructing impressive pieces for his fellow adventurers to discover. I think that growing up with a uh, pretty stereotypical working class family uh, impression of Detroit, there was a lot of negativity, there was a lot of seeing Detroit as a sad place. But I think as an artistic person, as a creative person, you can come through Detroit and you don't see the negative things, you see opportunity, you see potential, you see transition, you see a city in transition and uh, maybe on a threshold of some new uh, experience. So I think artistic people will find opportunity, they, they have creativity to make something out of nothing. I think that maybe the art process and, and just being an artist has a lot of qualities that I really like. Working on projects for me is very meditative, it's, it, it's, um, it's kind of my solace, it's my, my peaceful time is when I can work on site whether it's in the studio or, or in a gallery or museum or even in an abandoned building. I've been exploring vacant and unused spaces for most of my life since I was a kid. I, I grew up by the railroad tracks and I would hike on the railroad tracks and that would take me to kind of abandoned factories and, uh, and I just really started exploring all through my childhood into adulthood at these places. One of the reasons I'm attracted to being in Detroit is because nature has kind of started to reclaim territory here. There, I think there might be, I don't think it's just me, I think there might be a real uh, longing for this kind of wilderness. There might even be a longing for the age of discovery, there, like a longing for a time when you could find places that hadn't been found yet. Uh, and we kind of know that that's all gone. So I think that there's a part of me that really wants to try and not only find that feeling again, but maybe create that feeling so people can discover the pieces I'm working on. Uh, I didn't always blend photography and sculpture and installation work. It, it's just been an organic process. Uh, building sculptures on site, uh, that probably started about 10 years ago. And through the last 10 years, uh, I've transitioned into not only building sculptures site specifically, but needing to document that whole process so that other people could see it. The thing that I really love about exhibiting artwork is that you can make connections with people. Uh, I love how everyone has a different perspective on things. Everyone comes from such a different place and sees things from a different angle. And I think maybe that, that might be getting to the crux of it is that I love learning. I'm usually interested in making an art piece that speaks to a greater idea about this happening everywhere about 
trash and humans abandoning things and humans uh, wasting things more than I am talking about just Detroit's version of that. A lot of the abandoned buildings I work in in Detroit are abandoned and left that way because they're in places where people can kind of get away with it. They can just leave the building to go to waste and um, so yeah there is a part of me that is interested in working in spaces that will draw attention to something which I feel like might want to, I, I might think needs to be changed. So I think there are, are ways where I've done work that is recycling wasted materials or using spaces that seem to be neglected or that people look at as negative. And I decided I would use that material to make sculptures and in essence in some small way be cleaning up the trash that was dumped in these areas. So for instance I made this pyramid out of tires and that was all tires that I would find dumped throughout the city. Uh, the history of Detroit comes up a lot because I've grown up here but uh, one of the things I think I say pretty consistently is that people often talk about Detroit in the last 100 years. They see what happened at the birth of the automobile and they see where we are now and this is their microcosmic viewpoint of the history of Detroit but it's so incomplete. When someone comes to a city like Detroit and sees uh, decay and abandonment and things falling apart, nature reclaiming things, I think that uh, people can see that as a failure, they can see that from a nostalgic viewpoint of what used to be versus what's now, but for me I see it as a natural cycle. If we, we are a part of that, everything that we've made is a part of that, everything that has ever existed is a part of that, we're always transitioning, we're always evolving, we're always dying, and I, I don't know if everyone likes to think of that. Sometimes we want to remove ourselves from that, like somehow we're not a part of that, but we are, and to me, that's, there's something beautiful in that, and, and I, I think that it's almost an exercise for me to accept it by working with that all the time. I'm kind of becoming good with it, too. Over the years, I, I find it really the most intriguing thing. So this idea that somehow uh, the city is, I don't know, hit some point where it's is done to me is kind of ridiculous. The fact is that this is still a pretty interesting place to live and it will transition into something else. It just isn't going to be the same thing forever. It never has been the same thing. It always transitions. For more information on Scott Hawking's works and exhibitions, visit scotthawking.com. You'll also find links to these stories and much more at DetroitPerforms.org. Now each week, Detroit Performs will highlight the works of a mobile arts journalism team that traverses the city, capturing reviews about cultural experiences by citizen journalists. Providing a mechanism for dialogue about arts and culture, here is Critic Car Detroit. Okay, so I'm spending my day at the Detroit Institute of Art. And as you can see, it's close to Halloween, and there's sleepwalkers, and then they're like having things over there where you can go in, and they talk about sp spooky stories about the things. This project began two years ago, if I think of it. And as a journalist, the New York Times asked if I wanted to start writing some feature stories about Detroit. And the minute I came into the city, I started to see that this was one of the most fascinating stories I could ever have the privilege to cover. A couple of years ago, we grew concerned about the diminution of arts journalism across the country. And so we got together with the National Endowment for the Arts, and we decided to have a community arts journalism contest. What is it that could happen in their community to make sure that arts journalism stayed a vibrant part of the community? And we expected a few ideas, but much to our surprise, we got 243 ideas. A number of them came from Detroit. I personally think Detroit is one of the best cities for design. I mean, I think it's you know, very overlooked most of the time. I hadn't originally expected much, but almost I feel the artists have been inspired by uh, the rise and fall of Detroit. Because so much of Detroit and the community here is about this sort of DIY idea. With uh, the recent successful millage, we're excited that the museum is free for so many visitors. Young people, older people, mature people, everybody's here. So I think it's another step in uh, Detroit having a renaissance, coming back to where it belongs. In the process of reporting on 
Detroit, I noticed that the best voices coming out of the city were those of the residents here. The Detroiters who have lived in the city through all of its problems, who know the cultural history and legacy of Detroit. And it was their voices that I thought would be the best dialogue on arts and culture in Detroit. And eventually we picked three winners across America. And one of those winners was Critic Carr. Jennifer Collin and her team came to us and said, what if we asked the public what they thought about the movie, the opera, the symphony, the ballet? And we love that idea. We think that that kind of social interaction is what's going on in society anyway today. So we're very excited about Critic Car and what it's going to mean to arts criticism in Detroit and across the country. It's so easy to get to know about it once you like some things on Facebook. Either the DIA, the Car Center, the Detroit Design Festival. Yeah, I'm just happy to be here. This is my first time coming out to Detroit Design Festival, and so far it's been really good. I also went to Eastern Market after dark, which was phenomenal. It felt like one of those moments where uh, it was an idea that could have hatched a long time ago. Brought my family down for the weekend to visit and couldn't believe it that we stumbled into Delectricity. It's a nighttime exhibition of art and light and we're really looking forward to having more outdoor public art events in the city in the coming weeks. I am a huge fan of Eastern Market generally, so I was really excited to get the invitation that there's going to be just a bunch of open doors. What I wanted to really do was capture that moment when people have come out of a performance or are in the midst of experiencing a cultural event event and that enthusiasm, that very uh, forthright criticism that I like it, I don't like it, here's what I liked, here was my favorite part, that, the excitement, but for arts criticism and specifically citizen arts reviews, so I hope that people will feel free and I'm telling them feel free to say anything you want. I just walked out of the Ariel Angels uh, theatrical show which was bizarre, never seen anything like it. This is the one and only time we're gonna be performing this specific show. The show was born and dying right here today, tonight. The part where the woman with the whip did the thing with the flower was really funny. <laughs> um, we're looking at a projection right now that's broadcast outside the DIA. The electricity is a fun festival and the because they have a cool robot. He was a snowman and he could light up. He was very silly. A friend of mine got really upset, but I guess that's the point of art. It's supposed to like bring out you know, people's emotions and all of that. So um, it did its job, for better or worse. I looked at some of the galleries that I've been to in the past, like the Artifact Gallery over there and the Red Bull House of Art. It was a very traditional space being utilized in a very contemporary way and a very unexpected way. So we are on our way to making this happen and very excited to see what comes out of these reviews. And of course, the biggest goal was that people would share these on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube. So really my goal with Critic Car Detroit is to spread the word about Detroit arts and culture, but also to make the community feel that they are a part of what is happening in their city. I love what's going on at MOCAD. I think their contribution to de-electricity is very current. Five, ten years ago, the, these types of events were so raw and so independent. But it's mind-boggling because it's so interactive right now. Detroit is alive and well these days. They put their minds together and everybody's creating something beautiful. So if you're from Detroit, come check it out. If you're not from Detroit, come check it out anyway because it's definitely worth your while. You can view more Critic Car Detroit's reviews on their Facebook page and YouTube channel. And now, let's take a look at some of the arts events happening in our community.
Detroit has public works of art in its people mover stations. And as we continue the talks about mass transit on Woodward Avenue, art installation should be in the equation. Perhaps we can take a cue from New York City's Art for Transit program, which transforms subway stations into a canvas for public art. Take a look at the work of artist Tom Otterness. I loved to be able to pitch to such a hardcore New York audience down the subway. It, it, uh, it meant that I could pull out my blackest humor and I'd have some takers. You know, <laughs> that, uh, um, it is a hard audience to sell to. And people are, are on their way to work and, you know, pretty focused. So to break through that's a, a challenge. I usually try to make something that's that's subject specific, you know. So I went back immediately and did research on the building of the subways in the late nineteenth century and sort of the political era of the time, Tammany Hall, and I ran across Thomas Nast's work, the famous political cartoonist from that period, and I grabbed a a lot of stuff came straight from Nast, uh, the money bag head people, corruption. Almost all the projects start with drawing. And it's, it's a very simple kind of, it's almost an animation style of drawing, you know, that, that I can make my original, you know, I can make these figures and this idea of tubular arms and hands. I have types for these guys, you know, they're all in different social classes. This guy's like a white collar guy. Should he have pants? I guess. I can't tell you how many hours I've spent in that subway. I spent time drawing the telephones that existed there or the loudspeakers or um, people and how they would sit and hang out in the subways. I actually built a full scale model of a staircase and an overhead beams and the railings and everything in my studio. So there was some really meticulous planning but then when you actually get out on site, not all of it goes out the window, but certainly some of it does, and you have to respond to the real situation there. I think it's one of my talents, you know, this placing of work in this kind of Zen garden way, you know, or the unexpected. It's both a surprise and it's a nook or it's a cranny that you don't expect. Eye contact is really important for me so that I would be sure that you would have eye contact when you're walking up the stairs or that one work would look to another across the space. There are a few pieces that ask you to engage with it, you know. New Yorkers are very cool. It depends, you know, usually they'll sit next to it, but they're not often touching it, you know. They'll kind of like, I'm not really uh, being affectionate to the sculpture. I'm just sitting here because it's an empty seat. <laughs> I think I set a record. It was, it, it, the project went over a 10 year period. I kept adding more and more work and far beyond what I was under contract for. You know, I kept throwing more and more bronze in the more excited I got. And finally my wife said, that's, that's it. You know, you gotta like, save something for our daughter's inheritance, and she, she kind of uh, pulled, pulled me in. When I'm depressed, I go take a detour in the subway and go over to 14th Street and get out and just spend 15 minutes, and somebody's always there doing something with the work. And uh, I think, what's my problem? Everything's okay. <laughs> I get back in the subway, and I go on my way. You know, I, uh, it's really... It's one of the big payoffs of doing public work is just to see that all the time. Tom Otterness has also built larger than life sculptures for playgrounds, as well as has work featured in galleries across the country. To see more of his work, visit TomOStudio.com. Now, is creativity passed on from generation to generation? Emerging artist Asakile Safiel Gardner discovered this just might be the case. As the son of two of Detroit's most treasured cultural icons, 
There doesn't seem to be a lack of ingenuity in this family tree. Drawing is like working a puzzle and meditating and exercising and just so many things all in one. And at the end of it, you just feel kind of completed. And the more I work at it, the more I find out about myself, the more I explore my tendencies and my proficiencies, and the more I just kind of progress. And that self-progression, that self-analysis, that meditation inherent in drawing just pushes me to keep going in it. My mother is Marion Hayden, a veteran jazz player in the Detroit area. She's one of the founding members of the all-female group Straight Ahead, Grammy nominated. My father is Safel Gardner, a Detroit-based abstract artist who's been painting far longer than I've been alive, some 30 years. Seeing his work really help me to define my own working process. Seeing him in the studio every Saturday, just working for hours and hours and seeing how he handled things really kind of defined the way that I approach art as an artist, the process and the environment. So as different as we are, I'd say that a lot of what he did was passed on to me. From a very, very early age, I suppose I never really thought of it as drawing very much of the more I did it, the more I got used to it, the more I kind of improved, and the more I became aware of what I was doing, the more I became aware of it as drawing. Each piece serves as a kind of footnote as to where I was in my life at that time, to what I knew, what I understood. So I leave them as they are, and I just appreciate them for what they were at that time. Detroit is really, for me, a city of contrast. You see, a lot of art, but you see a lot of violence, you see a lot of decay, but you see a lot of beauty. Between all the renovations and all the history, between all the wreckage and all the construction, there's just this dynamic to Detroit. It's just consistently changing, evolving, and growing. Just to witness that is a really engaging experience. What's up guys, now we are here at the Detroit Institute of Arts with the director here, Graham Beal. How you doing today? Good thanks, how about you? I'm blessed, thank you. Now we are in the Swartz Room, right? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, well, this, this is an area um, that uh, is dedicated to works on paper, basically. Okay. Okay. Um, but we have a separate area for, for photography, so it's pr prints and drawings that appear in this gallery. And the Schwartz family um, uh, are great collectors of prints, and so okay. they, they sponsored this. Now tell me some about the artwork around here. You've got Van Gogh, other artworks around here. Can you tell me about those? Well, it's, it's um, as I never tire of saying, it's one of the greatest collections in this country. Okay. It's, it's extraordinary collection that goes back to ancient Babylon and all the way up to right now. All right, I like to hear that. Now, do you feature local artists here from the Detroit area? We have, we, we have um, local artists of this region in the collection permanently on view, yes, okay. but they're, they're not exhibited as by zip code, as it were. They're oh, okay. exhibited because they're artists and they're, we, we, we support their work. Okay, I like to hear that. So what's it like being the director of the DIA here in Detroit? Um, well, it, it, it's, uh, I came here because uh, 13 years ago because it's such a great collection mm -hmm. um, and we reinstalled the whole thing when we re rebuilt it and, and uh, we achieved what we set out to do which was uh, to become, as Wall Street Journal said, America's most visitor-friendly art museum. I'd have to agree. I think you're right, man. So Graham, what kind of events will draw people from the Detroit area here to the DIA? Um, well, we have changing special exhibitions, which is a, a part of our core activities. We have the big exhibitions in, the in a large space, and then we have rotating smaller exhibitions. We have exhibitions in this space and in the photography gallery. Friday nights, we're open till 10. We have music um, and okay. events like that. We have, a, one, we have the oldest film program of any U.S. 
uh, museum that okay. has shows a, a mixture of um, sort of old favorites and brand new films from abroad that don't get shown anywhere else. I like to hear that. All right, thank you very much. My pleasure. Graham Beale from the DIA. All right, and that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Performs. For more information on arts and culture, visit DetroitPerforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and upcoming information on arts events. Until next Tuesday, I'm DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Major funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the McGregor Fund. Additional funding is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.